Thank you, Tim, and thank you, Paul. And yes, good good afternoon, and uh, most of the faces. Um, lo lovely to see you again. Um, yes, this afternoon's talk: the deeper aspects of the seven rays um, and the importance of the seven ray psychology in the age of Aquarius. I think uh, could be added. Now, I actually want to start with um, the Queen and the chart of the Queen because. As I sat through, as I'm sure you did, all those weeks, whether you were watching or not, of blanket coverage by the TV companies following the passing of the Queen on the 8th of September this year. Um, I'd been looking at the Queen's chart for some time before then uh, but because of an inner prompt. Um, and it always seemed this autumn was going to be the time uh, that she was uh, going to be able to um, uh, free herself from this very, very difficult life. And why I say very difficult is it's been interesting to listen to all that the commentaries have said about the effect that was the Queen's life. Because the outside exoteric world doesn't have the esoteric understanding of the Queen's life. But given the information about her birth, we're able to draw up an esoteric chart. And we're not astrologers per se here today, but I just wanted to point out something to you that I've seen again and again and again in the chart of famous people. Famous people, anyone who's famous uh, has got a very strong 10th house. 10th house is the house of responsibility and it is the house of long-term karma. And famous people, who are given responsibility in the way that the Queen has come in with absolutely massive karma, as this chart shows. Not only is there a T-square with Saturn, the planet of long-term karma, there's incredibly difficult oppositions and inconjuncts with Mars. And she was Scorpio rising, which means that Mars was the ruler uh, of her um uh, soul's purpose, which was to have a very, very, very long life, which is the Saturn chronic uh, long life of responsibility and service. And so we hear all the nice things said about the Queen. And in fact, at that level, they're absolutely fine. But the point is, how does somebody become a queen or a king for that matter? And there's a similar thing in Charles's chart as well. It's where the soul has a desperate need to give that personality in incarnation massive responsibility. I've been checking the prime ministers in recent times. Um, and um, uh, with the exception of the current one, um, which I haven't looked at. But uh, if we think of the prime ministers going back to the 90s, they all exhibit the same pattern. And so if Gary was here, he'd talk about the archetype. He'd talk about the archetype of um, being famous, having responsibility and paying off long term karma. Uh, and in the Queen's case, much short term karma. Her Mars, ruler of the Ascendant, is placed in the first house of the soul in the sign of Aquarius, meaning that she had karma to give out to humanity. The first house is the house of the nation as well. So we could narrow it down to the nation. But we see that her influence went well beyond the nation of which she was the Queen. And it brings us back to the important point of causes. We are all too guilty of looking at uh, effects in this modern world because it takes effort to look behind in causes, which are subconscious in nature. So all those people doing work on this the subconscious and trying to bring through, bring things through for people are doing very, very good work have to be careful because um, sometimes things can be brought to the surface and the personality is not strong enough to be able to deal with it. But um, uh, on the 8th of September, the progress moon set off a, a T-square, which is, you know, one arm short of a cross. 
uh, a T-square, including both karmic planets, Mars and Saturn, uh, and the planet of death, which is Neptune. And at the same time, her progress sun set off a square to progress Mars. This would be relatively sudden, a death that's relatively sudden, although the, the, the illnesses that led to it, I don't think have been expounded on really, um, uh, would have been chronic in nature. So I just wanted to say that uh, as I sat there, and listened to all these comments being made about the Queen. Not once did I hear anything about why the Queen was the person that she was. And again, the esoteric chart shows with such great simplicity. I think I probably sent a copy to uh, uh, to Tim and, and a few other people uh, because it is so fascinating. And it just never fails to give the answers. So I wanted to mention that because uh, as the year is reviewed, we're going to have all this again, no doubt, with the Queen and her life. Um, and if anybody is interested in the particular chart that I drew up with the comments that I put on it, and there's also a page commentary to go with it, uh, I would be very happy um, to send it to them. Um, OK, so. We say that the um, seven ray psychology um, or e even Madame Blavatsky has hinted at it. Uh, it's not for the many, it's for the few. And it brings me around to why I do esoteric astrology and the filtering that goes on with the clients that I get. And I don't do that filtering. It's that, that That's done by a, a higher agency, of course. And it's the view, uh, the spiritual view, and I pass it to you, uh, that only between 8 and 10% of the population have their soul awakened. And that being the case, um, we are mindful that the involutionary arc falling from spirit into matter has those individuals on it who are simply gaining reaction capacities uh, in this life. So the idea of being able to um, react to the environment physically, emotionally and mentally. And that's all we do on the uh, and the soul sleeps while this process goes on, because it's a process that just the personality and their environment is um, involved in. We get to the Nadir and we go to the path of evolution and we have the eight to ten percent that I'm suggesting uh, where the uh, the soul on the vertical arm of a cross, which otherwise would just have an outer life here, the inner life starts to make itself felt. And that inner life is encouraging us to know ourselves. Know, knowledge. Fifth ray, we'll talk about it a bit later on. Fifth ray of concrete knowledge and analytical science. Man, woman, know thyself cannot change yourself and you know yourself. And so those of, of this percentage will turn inwards, be interested in meditation, study, yoga, anything where the energies are going to be channeled uh, so that there can be an expansion of consciousness, not by interplay with the environment, an expansion of consciousness within. And so we have for these people, the small percentage, an integration process. And this integration process is a fascinating one, which does need some study. I'm going to mention it today, but we can't go into it. It's more like a workshop thing. The integration process of, for example, for me, a third ray personality, third ray of active intelligence. I'm going to assume some basic knowledge of what the rays are with a second ray soul. How does a third ray personality integrate with a second ray soul? So, you know, we can't talk sensibly about, but many books do try to do, says about soul integration or so you know, the soul infused personality and i'll say well what's the rare of the person i say oh i don't know that what's the rare of the soul no 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 this is the soul and the personality coming together but when we bother and sometimes it is bother to read what the masters say about this we see it's a very complicated process and it's laid out um at the master level in, of course, Esoteric Psychology 2, one of the 24 books of Esoteric Astrology, um, uh, Philosophy by Alice Bailey, but also in modern times to the recently deceased 
um, Michael Robbins, and some of you may have heard of him, two massive tomes uh, called Tapestry of the Gods, where each and every ray is gone through as um, a soul ray, a personality ray, uh, and um, a mental, uh, emotional, and physical ray, uh, and body rays as well. So all that work's been done studied at by in the university uh, um, of the seven rays that set up there and many people here um, and I've seen a couple of names here I know who actually uh, also um, look at the um, uh, webinars of the seven rays so the integration process is there if you want to look it up and uh, therefore you would need to have some idea and uh, motivation to find out what your your own rays are. But there is a prime duality, and that duality is touched on before, is spirit and matter. And we need to, at a couple of points here, turn to our understanding of the Garden of Eden. Um, do we really understand the story about the Garden of Eden, whether we've read it in the Bible or biblical studies through church or our own interest or the tree of life whatever it might be but i'm going to come back to it but i want to mention it now and say we're talking here about the falling from a subjective bliss into a material objectivity and if we look at the old testament and we hear about god the father aspect moses Ten, uh, uh, the Ten Commandments, karma, and the first ray, we get a very clear impression uh, that God isn't this kind of person that some of the Christian people, and remember the, the Old Testament is Judaism, it's not Christianity. They don't like it. And... <laughs> As I've been, as I have been uh, studying some Christian theology, we get other students who are baffled by the fact that if you read Joshua in the Old Testament, one of the history books, as it's called, who went in, stormed Jericho, broke the walls down, killed everybody in there, sparing just one lady, a prostitute, just one and her family through a deal already struck with the covenant of Israel, we get this idea of a God that we don't understand. Well, I say I didn't initially understand it until we come to an idea of the rays. And the ray one is the ray of will and power, but it creates, maintains, and destroys. And it has one particular planet, Pluto, which is the destroying agency. And there are far too many people, in my opinion, who are thinking that the spiritual path is sweetness and light and love. And it isn't. It's the destruct. It is partly, of course it is, but it is also partly the getting rid of those forms of human life uh, and human ways and human cultures which are not fit for purpose in the Aquarian age. And we're seeing it. We're seeing it to great extent. I don't have to tell you what's been happening in the world in the last few years. We all know about it. This is directly the agency of the planet Pluto in the sign of Capricorn. As I pointed out in many talks on esoteric astrology, it's very, very clear, very clear what's happening. And it goes back to the Old Testament days of destruction. And it seems that we've now got a culture that doesn't like this type of thing and will map on all different reasons about for this and for that of why these things are happening. And so that's the first thing I wanted to, to say to you is that the theologians today are in really between a rock and a hard place. Because whilst they believe in their God, they don't want this God to be the destroying type of God, which uh, has been shown to be the case um, in the modern world, but also is very well documented. Look at the five books from Genesis through to Numbers, including Deuteronomy and Exodus. You know, the violence in those books, the destruction in those books 
is something that cannot be got away from. And we do need to have a more, I think, adult view about these things rather than saying uh, that we should be just on a softer path. We have to understand this. And we have to understand it particularly because there is this line between spirit and matter. And my understanding, my suggestion to you today is that it was believed through Moses that the um, having defaulted in the Garden of Eden so that man could get uh, a material experience in the world, that the way back to God could be directly with, first of all, the chosen race, Israel, and then the rest of humanity. And it didn't work. It didn't work. And the Old Testament chronicles said it didn't work. And later on in the Old Testament, the prophets came along because plan B had to be put into operation and the birth of Jesus. We'll come, come to that in a moment. Um, this idea then that we are looking at a scheme of evolution which means we can't go from matter back to spirit without the help of an agency. And that agency was given to me, uh, or the triangle was given to me uh, a few years back, very, very vividly and built into Christianity as well, that we have this trinity of Father, Son and Holy Ghost wasn't given to Holy Spirit, I should say. So they use now Holy Spirit. And it was given to me in the colours of red, the first ray of will and power, indigo, the second ray of love wisdom, and green, the third ray of active intelligence. But it was given to me astrologically, as it might be. And at the bottom was the sun, the personality, matter. There it is, the circle with the dot. The line going up is the earth, and the earth is uh, the uh, circle with the cross in it. And that is said to be the monad. That is where we are going. The sign we are now understand, I understand the information that I've had, is that the earth, wherever the earth is, and the sign it's in in your chart, is the indication of the sign of the monad. Esoteric astrology in all the books today, oh, and there's not that many of them anyway, in all the books, it only talks about the soul's purpose. It doesn't go any higher. The soul, the ascendant, is this off here. So we've got matter and spirit, personality and monad. That is the prime evolution. That is where we are headed. We are headed uh, back to the father. But we have got to get there by the circuitous path of taking in the saviour. And the saviour is the redemptive force of the Christ impulse, which is collectively our souls. And so plan B was to be able to um, bring uh, an agency which would allow us to return to spirit, the father, through the purification of the personality that Christ was to show us. And the famous words in John, of course, um, in the Gospel of John, no man sees the father except through me. It couldn't be clearer. We cannot get to the monad without working through the Christ consciousness. And that Christ consciousness, I think, has been somewhat neglected in theosophy, but it is absolutely vital in my understanding of theosophy to understand that what has been given out by the life, the work, the teachings, the healings of Christ and the purification of the personality uh, laid down in those gospel stories uh, is well worthy of our revisiting, which I'm doing. I wouldn't suggest this unless it was something that I was doing, because I have been told from within it is where I need to be about. There are still impurities in the consciousness that need to be and can be by aligning with the words and i gave this out at another talk and somebody said to me but i don't believe in going to church and i said i haven't mentioned the word church here 
church is the man's idea and man's reaction and man's devotional processes as a response to what was given out all of those years. OK, so um, I'll get on to a little bit more detail about this. If you look at the first three, if you look at the three objectives of the Theosophical Society, you'll see that the first one is about love. And that the next two are about wisdom. OK, we all know them, so we don't have to look at them too deeply to know that that is the case. And so the Theosophical Society is, in theory, offering us this um, excursion into consciousness, which takes in the idea of love wisdom. And because it's a duality that is one energy, it's 85 percent of Gemini, which is two poles, one pole of love, one pole of wisdom. Roman numeral two sign of Gemini, one energy. So this idea of love wisdom is the way to the father. We cannot go to it directly. And we can see what mankind has made of the religions. We can see what that has happened. My what I have been a, a, a indicated to do is to go back to the essence of the teachings of Christianity and look at them in the way of love wisdom. And of course, any of us studying uh, theosophy related subjects that I mentioned before. Uh, will understand uh, that they've probably been doing this for a while. But there comes a certain time when you have to kind of pull it all together and synthesize it so that it can be something useful in your life. And you can say, well, I've learned this, but it truly is wisdom in that I apply it to my life. And this is the redemption of the personality uh, that, um, that, that Jesus talked about and gave people the opportunity to uh, get back to their monads. Otherwise, it looks like we if we can't get back to the monad directly for some of the reasons that I've mentioned, and then we knock out the idea of the Christ consciousness, we're going to be playing around with mental matters and we're not going to we're not going to achieve the goal uh, of returning to the father's home. And I look at humanity and I think, well, you know, um, how, how many have got the chance of doing that in any case, as we look at the world? So I'm suggesting we need to be more spiritually mature uh, and recognize that this idea of the individual souls, which theosophy and other bodies might teach us is so important, is just part of a strata of energy. And that strata of energy is the Christ consciousness. So there is, as it appeared to me, one larger soul. <laughs> There's some Indian influence in there as well. One larger soul coming along, lit up by the Christ consciousness. And I know that Paul has sent me something on the Gospel of Mark, which has been looked at by some Indian guru. And some of the depths that that, that Indian has got to in understanding Mark, uh, uh, for me, was um, absolutely astounding. Um, so, you know, we're not talking about Christianity as a Western culture here. We're talking about it as a spiritual understanding and the fact that there is a lot in metaphor and symbol that needs to be worked through to get true meanings. So what am I saying in practical terms? It means that we have to imbue our personalities, soak our personalities with the energy of love wisdom in order to return to the monad. That's our journey. And this is why the life of Jesus and the Christian faith referred to uh, as redemption and the saviour. It's the saviour from being abandoned by spirituality and living a life of nothing but materiality and living and dying and having no consciousness of anything higher. So we've talked about this idea of esoteric astrology having a soul's purpose. But I've also indicated that my understanding is that we have a monadic sign as well. My monadic sign, for the sake of illustration, is Scorpio. And Scorpio is discipleship. Um, if ever I was a disciple, having spent 12 years studying the works of Alice Bailey with the arcane school, uh, then I don't know what is discipleship, but I did that before I was uh, able to know what my monadic sign was or understand about the earth. But Scorpio is also change. 
and the idea uh, of uh, the phoenix rising from the ashes. It's quite a drastic sign. And it can it can mean that we have to uh, endure periods of um, crisis as well as harmony as we're taken further and further up. This, is, of course, is the divine fourth ray. And it's worth pointing out, of course, that the, the divine fourth, they're all divine rays, the divine fourth ray of harmony through conflict tells us that conflict is divine. And again, I meet so many people doing their jobs who don't like the idea of conflict. You know, we don't want this conflict. This isn't right. This isn't what spirituality is about. Well, my spirituality is about a very rocky road of a mountainside, sometimes with help, sometimes without it. And I think if we're all honest, we'll know at times in our lives we've been on it and are still on it and are perhaps a, approaching the peak where there's even less, less grass under our feet than there was maybe a couple of years ago. And so I'm happy with that. I'm, I'm happy that I can understand Scorpio. Um, but also these two rays here, the ray of the God of the Old Testament, ray one, will and power, and ray two of the crime. Of course, we can't map one onto the other. But I've now read Oxford and Cambridge scholars, theologians, trying to do just that. Trying to say oh, Joshua didn't really invade Jericho and Ai and kill all these people because Jesus says we've got to be nonviolent. And they're trying to put the two rays completely together when they are in fact totally different energies and it's interesting to see that i couldn't have made these delineations without my knowledge of the race or encouraging here uh, a, a greater understanding of what these rays mean and applying it um to to the idea of well coming on to initiation now but also to remind you with these two rays about the two threads that keep us going now one of those threads, and this is nothing to do with us as personalities, we will weave the third creative uh, uh, thread of active intelligence. But one of these threads goes from the monad to the heart, and it's called the life thread. It's a stream of energy, but it's called a thread, the life thread, from the monad to the sinus node of the heart. And that keeps us alive and represents will. Nothing to do with consciousness, nothing to do with consciousness. And one of the things we have to develop is a will that, first of all, is attuned to be able to help the personality get through what it needs to get through and then turn its will to a higher, more spiritual will. Nothing to do with consciousness, any of that. The consciousness thread comes from the soul and is anchored in the cortex of the brain, consciousness. And when we die, the soul, uh, uh, through a command from the monad, will invoke the first ray of will and power, destroy your aspect, and break those threads. Sometimes just the consciousness thread can be broken in a hospital bed for some individuals, but they're still alive not conscious, they're still alive because the life thread from the monad to the heart is still operative, but the consciousness thread isn't. And so, yes, the prime task is to link our personality with the monad, the first ray aspect, but we can't do it without the intervention of the soul. And this process reaches its culmination at the third initiation. So if we are to live a life that, like was described by Jesus, and we're able to make the appropriate cultural changes that are required, uh, and this is the purpose or should be the purpose of modern day Christian theology, rather than going back to the Old Testament and saying, no, God isn't wrath, wrath, uh, wrathful and, destru and destructive. Um, we could perhaps see what's happening and translate it into modern day thinking. You know, we've got this idea of money, um, it comes up in the New Testament frequently, the tax man. Jesus says you cannot serve two masters. You cannot follow God and take people's money. For me, the old chestnut 
is always the problem of wealth and what we do with wealth. Are we a Lord Nuffield, second race soul, I believe, giving our millions away altruistically to build a chain of hospitals that's still in operation and working very well in cahoots with the public sector and today? Or are we going to stash it away for our own or our own family's sake? Alice Bailey called money concrete prana. Uh, remember that our personalities have been shown away, and I've been talking about that, that we can become consciously more Christ-like. Christ -like. That doesn't mean pouring over scriptures. It means referring to them, but extracting from them the essence of what it could be to be a wonderful human being based at the heart level, with no solar plexus involvement in your own desires and your own welfare, but putting others first. Yes, there'll always be things you need to do to pay your council tax, etc., whatever it might be. But in the New Testament, we get some wonderful stories. And don't we always find the same thing? It's the humble, so-called insignificant people of that society who actually get to the spiritual goal more quickly. Think in Matthew's gospel of the Beatitudes, the humble and the meek, who are going to inherit the earth. We have to look at the strength of our personalities. Now, I'm saying that our personalities can be strengthened if we stand on the shoulders of a giant such as the Christ and incorporate those wonderful features of love wisdom into our life. And then we can continue on the path, the first ray path to the monad. And the path to the monad is the return to the father's home that I believe is our destiny as human beings. But whether we're all going to make it there, and I don't, I, 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 I just don't know, because I don't see the Christ energy imbued in that many people. And I regularly now attend our church just to view this, just to see what's going on and how many people that do go to church are people. And I found a handful of them. But it is quite concerning that this, if this information that I've been given and I'm suggesting it to you now, if this information is correct, then there is a very steep path for many people uh, to climb. So that's the first point I wanted to make, really about the Old and New Testaments and the first and second ray. But to complete the Trinity, the Holy Spirit is said to be the fire that is behind the scriptures. And so we're given something for our minds. We've only got to open the lectionary or the Bible to see the wonderful work that is there to be studied and complemented. And better than that, I would suggest, as I've brought a few of them, get yourself a Bible commentary and see what other people have made of the scriptures. But a New Testament one to start off with as well. There was somebody in the Middle Ages called Kempis. And Kempis was the person who wrote a book called The Imitation of Christ. And if you get a modern day, it's still still available as a classic. If you get that book, The Imitation of Christ, and you see the modern day version of it, you'll see the sort of things that should fill you with the joy if you could turn your personality to that type of um, idea. Uh, because the one thing where I think uh, knowledge uh, and the um, accumulation of knowledge can go wrong, it can be self-empowering. Uh, to the point that somebody said, well, I know about this now. I've done a course on that now, etc." And they are. But actually, what's important is your attitude. How humble are you? How able are you with all that you have or haven't got to stand in the shadow of the cross and say, well, if I need to take my cue from anybody, I've got plenty of information about it. You know, just if you look at the life of that individual and the manner of the death as well. Now, the second thing I wanted to talk about mainly this afternoon was the bringing in um, uh, uh, to this idea already introduced of the so-called Western esoteric tradition. The Western esoteric tradition, and this is something that was um, uh, very strong with a couple of theosophists, um, 
I forget the names now that I knew anyway, um, holds that there are seven life swarms which have all come down. Um, the first three on the first ray of will and power, love, wisdom, and the third ray of active intelligence. And all those swarms were in uh, evolutionary terms before humanity. And therefore, in the seven rays, humanity's consciousness relates to ray four, art, ray five, science, ray six, religion, and ray seven, let's just call it the ray for the age of Aquarius. And we look at humanity's history and its expression of energy and say, yes, the arts, we can see the great Renaissance and we can see uh, some of the wonderful things that people like Leonardo da Vinci did and other painters and sculptures and the wonderful classical musicians that we have with the Bachs and the Beethovens and the Mozarts, etc. This is the expression of art under the fourth ray and the fourth swarm in Eastern tradition. The fifth swarm, not, not yet fully uh, um, uh, in play yet, um, in manifestation, I should say, the fifth ray of science. And of course, there was no science around 2000 years ago when Christ was, uh, you know, when our story uh, of earlier there, but it's coming, it's coming in, in the age of Aquarius. It's very frequently forgotten or not known, perhaps, that the age of Aquarius is 40% the energy of the ray of concrete knowledge and analytical science. And it's my very definite prediction in the next 2000 years, we will see science make huge leaps and bounds in understanding the invisible worlds. They're already there in my view with understanding the etheric, uh, one up from the physical in the quantum worlds. But remember, uh, by their own admission, dark energy and dark matter, which are as yet undiscovered in scientific terms as to what they are and what that energy is composed of, makes up about 95% of the known universe. So there's a long way for science to go. But we need to know that. And we also need to know that, um, or be reminded if we know it, uh, that Dwaj Kool promised etheric vision for a certain proportion in the age of Aquarius. Etheric vision would absolutely revol revolutionize the, uh, the, the health uh, service and the idea uh, that things can be seen, um, cancers could be seen as a shadow in the etheric before they even had the chance to start to manifest physically as a tumor. This is a sort of scientific development uh, that's been promised by the masters uh, for those who have got the mind to be able to turn inwards enough to actually see this. And some people have it in any case. They can see auras. They can see auras. They can see health auras and they can diagnose in this way. But they're few and far between, as I understand it. And this is more for humanity uh, uh, in this age. And then, of course, the sixth ray of devotion and idealism. And you can break down the three major religions even into the rays. So deeper aspects of the ray. Uh, Islam is ruled by ray one. Just look at the way uh, that the, the Islam, and if you take Sharia law, for example, and you look at some of the destructive processes that go on there, um, and you might say evil and you might say wicked and why are we holding the World Cup in Qatar or whatever, but the important point is, it's first ray. And if we're going to understand first ray, we're going to need to remember creator, maintainer and destroyer. And that works all the way down. Um, talking to somebody recently who destroyed a relationship at what they believed was the right time, because you can create something, you can get into it. It can be a job, a career like it was with me. And then you destroy it because it's finished. It. But it takes will to do that and that remember is that line between personality and monad will then of course christianity which is the second ray of love wisdom and thirdly judaism which is active intelligence and one of the things that we've got from judaism is the very wonderful tree of life 
And if you've got nothing else to go to, to look at the tree and to see Kepha as pure spirit and Malkuth as pure earth and um, uh, materiality. And you see uh, between those set the centers of consciousness on a middle, middle, middle pillar and side pillars and 32 paths. And you want to know yourself, but then find out which path you're on, on the tree of life. The tree of life was decimated from the bottom down um, with the um, uh, the casting out, as it were, symbolically of um, mankind from the Garden of Eden. And we've been rebuilding uh, ever since. So I was talking about the seven, um, the swarms, uh, this idea, these swarms, um, the, the four, five, six and seven are referred to as the swarms of humanity under those rays, four, five, six, and seven. The Lords of Flame, these are the first swarm to come down. Um, they're said to be uh, those beings that came from Venus originally and were able to implant, as we know from our theosophical teachings, the seed of abstract thought into the minds of rudimentary um man making it some kind of mind um instead of being some uh, uh creature lolloping around in the age of lemuria only interested in survival abstract thought gives us the ability of course to think uh, in terms other than our survival and the lords of the flame are the now the archangels of the various spheres of the tree of life and i could name them um, but it's not going to help us that much with this talk. I just want to speak to you about one of the archangels, the Lords of Flame, that is known as Metatron. Metatron is said to be the archangel of the sphere of Kepha, the highest in the tree of life. And Metatron is the individual responsible for giving the glyph of the tree of life to man. Now, I believe it's a marvellous thing because in that glyph of the tree of life with Kepha as pure spirit and Malkuth as pure materiality, the tree of life has a centre, Tipperath, and that is said to be the crucified and the risen Christ. So we have Judaism, which is powered along by knowledge and the third ray of active intelligence, how to respond to that knowledge, also corresponding to the Holy Spirit. And that is said to be uh, why the Holy Spirit is aligned with the scriptures. Now, our consciousness, therefore, needs to be resurrected in the second form of the teachings, which is predominantly Alice Bailey, also Lucille Cedarcrans. Um, and these teachings are predominantly about saturating consciousness so that it's fit to be able to return to the father's home, which isn't on the consciousness thread, but on the life thread. And these two threads that we have here keep the individual human being in incarnation. And in the building of the Antakarana, we don't have anything to do with these threads. These threads are above our mode of operation. But as a deeper aspect of esoteric psychology, we need to bear ray one life thread and ray two consciousness thread in mind. So what's our task here then as a human being in terms of the energetic side of things? We have to build the rainbow bridge. This is all to do with the third ray of active intelligence. How actively are you using your intelligence to, so that as a human being, you are creative? Now, again, the astrology provides us with a wonderful ground plan, because if you've had a chart done with me, you know, I talk about opening knowledge petals, love petals and sacrifice petals. And this is our creativity in this lifetime. In what way are we being creative? Tim is extremely creative using the third ray of active intelligence. Teresa might be extremely creative in using the second ray of love wisdom. And um, other people like Paul, particularly so with the first ray of will and power. And so we need to know that we're doing something creative along divine energetic lines. And that's what these rays provide us with, definitions of what is a divine energetic line.
So when we're born, we have a consciousness thread, as discussed. We have a life thread, and they're part of the Antakarana. I do a whole talk on this. The Antakarana is that energy um, which is uh, the idea we have to link to it. So human endeavor, repeatedly in lifetime after lifetime, we are building this creative thread. So there's the idea that the Lords of Flame are behind the first ray, the Lords of Form, uh, yeah, the Lords of Form are behind the second ray. They're the builders. It's constructive, a builder of forms and attempts to preserve those forms. And then we have the Lords of the Mind. The Lords of Mind are those which allow the mind to be used to whatever scope of creativity we can put our energies to. And if we're not creative, that just means that we're not pulling down energy from the horizontal arm of the cross. I'm just going to get the sun out of my eyes. It's better. Um, so that we're not. Um, we're not in the situation where we are just reacting to our outside environment, reacting to problems with the family. What is it that we're doing that defines us? in a creative way. And I've often thought that we will be guided as to the areas of creativity through the chart, but also through our intuition. If we have a highly developed intuition, we can uh, often see the way that we're meant to do it. And we may not know why we've been pulled into that, but almost certainly it will be to do with past lives. So, We need to remember with energy about karma, which is the point I started at. Um, the misuse of free will leads us to uh, difficult karma. Uh, and the misuse of free will in the world today has caused the karma of the world situations. Um, because the Eastern, Eastern esoteric tradition holds that when the first three swarms were in operation there was no epigenesis an epigenesis is the waiting for one swarm to finish its work whilst uh, before the next swarm can begin but with humanity there has been that waiting and this waiting has led to the epigenetic activity of free will and it's what we've done with our free will in going off as a detour from the divine plan that has caused the problems on the earth. And the masters can't intervene. It's our karma. But they can point the way and point individuals to a way to correct um, that deviation. And so, you know, importantly, there is so much to understand about karma. And if we wanted, to do it simply, we would talk about harmlessness and say harmlessness in uh, thought, word and action will take us a long way to nullifying any margin karma that we have. Uh, and that's the only karma we can affect because if it's long term karma, it will come back in various doses in different lives and we'll have to pay that off when it comes but we can certainly by modifying our attitude and becoming more christ-like and more humble we're far far likely to be harmful in any way at all if we take on uh the qualities uh, as it as indicated before there it's interesting uh that the western esoteric tradition also holds that the lords of flame are behind the manifested laws of physics and those which have not yet been discovered which will be quantum realm and the dark matter, et cetera, beyond, that the, for, the, the lords of, ma, um, of form are behind the laws of chemistry and the, law, the swarm, which is the lords of mind, are behind the laws of biology. But the four swarms that are going to be behind the um, uh, of humanity will be behind the laws of sociology. 
is sociology an art? Is it a science? I've been having some discussions with people I know who teach sociology. And there's, you know, it's it's a wonderful subject, but it's all about human behavior. And that's what these swarms are about. And so science has got pole position, if we accept what the Western esoteric tradition says, in those swarms being behind those natural laws in those subjects which go to make up science which go to make up the fifth ray, the mind of God in many cases. And I'm talking about God here being God transcendent, which is uh, links us back to um, uh, the top of the tree of life where we have the, um, uh, the unmanifest becoming manifest. So these three great swarms will have done their work and go on to other things, but they are not called the swarms in the Bailey literature. They're called the first ray, the second ray and the third ray. I'm attempting through deep contemplation to put these ideas together for you, uh, for me first and then for you as well. Um, the Lords of Flame, many have returned to source and many of them um are working in the highest spiritual realms, as I was talking before about Metatron being the archangel, their arch uh, archangelic intelligence. So that's my attempt to correlate the seven rays to the seven swarms of the esoteric traditions. I believe these fit well together. We must also remember that we're work in progress as human beings. And that leads me to the idea of how did it all begin with in the first place uh how did it start um and you know this idea uh, that there was an unmanifest at some stage and that unmanifest had no properties none whatsoever that we could know on but then there was a will to change the immersion in uh, the inertia into a dynamic and that dynamic caused a movement in the unmanifest but the unmanifest will to remain unmanifest and so there was a pull on the movement and in the end a circle was traced out and that circle which can be known as the will of god is known as the ring cosmos and it relates to the first ray of will because it is the beginning of a man vantara out of a pralaya, to give it the uh, theosophical terms. But all the time, the ring, the that ring was uh, forming itself. There was, in order to create uh, attention for it and stop it happening was the ring chaos and the ring chaos was wanting to take us back into this unmanifest situation and they were the two rays and for aeons these rays were spinning together uh, until uh, there was nothing more that they could uh, uh, purchase on each other and the third ring pass knot actually enveloped them and so we have three spinning rays which relate to my understanding of the evolution of the first ray the second ray and the third ray and that sphere that is caused by these three rays is what we understand in widest esoteric terms as a cosmos not a universe that comes a lot lot later but we're going back to primal energy here which is this idea um of the three rays um without circumscription there can be no manifestation and we can take that down to when we want to manifest something in thought, because if we describe something from the general to the particular in thought, a matter, an issue, something we want resolving, and then we reason back from the particular to the general, we will have circumscribed in thought what that particular issue is there's nothing emotional here yet there's nothing other than mental that corresponds to the ring cosmos and then we put the energy of our emotion creatively into giving that some oomph giving that form some life and that 
is the ring chaos. So you've got the two rings together. And then we actually desire, using lower emotion, we desire that to come into manifest, gives us the ring past knot. And we have created a miniature cosmos by that. And you should try that if you've got a matter that you feel you want to have control over. You can't think in a straight line about it. People do, oh, I'm going to pray for this. No. You have to have a circle involved. That's why I've taken the time this afternoon to actually go back to the formation of the ring cosmos and this idea of a circular flow of thought rather than a linear thought. So you reason from the general to the particular of the issue and then go backward from the particular to the general and you will sub circumscribe the matter in consciousness in order for it to manifestation. And the message is always the same. With no circumscription, there is no manifestation. And that's something that I wanted to talk to you uh, uh, about. Um, Diane Fortune in particular, she used to think this was very, very important uh, that we um, use our instincts and lower emotions to provide a motive power for what we think in the higher realms. So these are some of the things uh, to ponder on that I call the deeper significance of the rays. They've come to me because I've studied 40 years and uh, uh, the rays, as wonderful as a subject as it is, can't stand on its own as the rays. Oh yes, I do the psychology you know, or, or I, I know about the seven rays. We have to see it in broader spiritual terms. And so the two scenarios I presented you with are Christianity and particularly Judaism, the Old and New Testament and the Western esoteric tradition. There's pages more of it, but I do think, Tim, I should just uh, call a halt there after about an hour and just see uh, whether people want any more, whether they want to uh, turn their minds off or whether they've got any questions or comments. So I'll give it a break for now. Thank you very much uh, indeed, Ted, as always, for a fascinating and uh, very erudite lecture. Well, I, I have a question um, to begin with, not surprisingly. Um, early on in your talk, you mentioned about, I think the figure was seven or eight or 10%, um, I can't remember what the word you used. Was it connected to their soul or having um, soulful personality? Was was that the phrase you used? Yeah. Yeah. OK, I, I, I'll explain it um, uh, in, in a bit more detail. And just to say, uh, Tim and everybody, um, I'm suggesting this uh, because it's been given to me um, internally. So um, the idea that the... Uh, the relative awakening of human beings to spiritual life development, the need to improve the personality is limited to as few as possibly 8%, which means that in that 8%, there is an impulse coming down on the vertical arm of the cross which means that there is a stimulation of energy into the consciousness of that person to deal with things of a spiritual nature. So if you take the whole of humanity, we all have a horizontal arm of the cross, which is everything to do with relationship, be it work, family, personal, business, the outside world, hobbies, pleasure, whatever it might be, when we open up our eyes and go into that outside world, and of course we have to because there's our karma, there's our dharma, there's our duty, our obligation, our challenges, you know, our ambition, all those things take us out there. And that's for the 100%. But for the 8 to 10%, they've got an additional line of energy to deal with. And that line of energy uh, is coming from an awakened soul. Okay, so the soul, if we consider it some somewhere uh, above the crown center, somewhere up here. The soul is energizing that person to look at matters spiritual. And these people are then, when they get used to this idea, take it into the world and their output 
is completely different because their output is inspired by the energy uh, of the soul, which is pouring in through whichever rays, but pouring into them and making them interested in one of those areas of service, we would say, at rays one to seven. But it's a bit more complicated because we've got the whole ray structure of the person. So this idea has come from the fact that we didn't all start our evolution together and there are younger souls on the involutionary arc which make up the the, the, the higher percentage who haven't yet reached the nadir uh in terms of their personalities so you know um this idea that personality is a uh stereotyped set of reaction capacities it's got all these reaction capacities and then at the nadir the soul says enough You've gone out into that outside world enough and got enough reaction capacities to human existence that we now want to call you back home, call you back home, and you're going to be energized in this way. And then the struggle begins because this horizontal arm of the cross is strong. It's had many, many lifetimes to be built upon. And people can feel this and yet want to be here. This is our comfort zone. This is what we know. I've been down here before. Yeah, I, I know it is to build a career, to have a family, to do this. To, I feel quite comfortable with it. And we've got skills. We've got accomplishments on there. And this is what makes some people very good at life in the outside world. They're old souls. But they started first and they came, they came down first as well. So one of the things that I had to understand through this idea of Christianity is this idea of tolerance that there are these souls who are very young um, and they've not built the reaction capacities yet, so they're not going to be pushed by the vertical arm of the cross. So I can say to somebody, look at this, and they'll read it and they'll go, ah, it doesn't mean anything to me at all. You know, don't, don't trouble me with this. You know, the World Cup started now, what's the score? That type of thing. So I hope that helps a little bit. Um, I'll go back to what Dr. Baker would say. Dr. Baker would say it is the intrinsic quality of your consciousness, what the content of your consciousness that will determine whether you are in the 8% or not. Because if you are only really interested in your own life, your own survival and everything that affects you directly, you are not on spiritual consciousness wavelength in this lifetime, and you're likely to be in the 90% rather than the 10%. So, so to just I know Teresa wants to come in, but these are people who are actually born this way. This is not something that's acquired during incarnation. This is how people enter this life, yes? Yes, yes, absolutely. And if we want to use the, 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 the very good example or analogy of hereditary and environment, you know, this thing that uh, genetic in, in, in genetics, uh, the characteristics are either inherited or they're acquired. Um, we're talking very much that it's our past lives that have our heredity, uh, spiritual heredity that is determined this point in this lifetime now it's not something we can just switch on to we, it, we, we, we we i'm not saying we couldn't but there will be no validity to say switch but i don't think there'd be any interest to do it anyway okay i think teresa had her hand up so uh over to you teresa thank you yes i've just got a question um ted in david hawkins book um from power to force he talks, he does a lot of the maths and the logarithmic scales, um, mapping consciousness. And he suggested that the 15%, once 15% of the population reach a level of consciousness or are operating at a certain level of consciousness, they naturally lift the other 85% up. And this is the reason we haven't self-destructed and, and wiped ourselves out to date. Yeah. And I would sort of look when you talk about eight to ten percent, and then I look at what's going on at the world in the world in the last few years and the accelerated rate of change we're in now. I wonder, are we heading from a sort of an eight to ten percent to that critical mass of 15%? Because in the Bailey work, it talks about 
we won't be be experiencing individual initiation like happened to masters in the past, but it will be group initiation. And I'm wondering if there's some kind of magical crossing point where enough people are reaching these levels of consciousness that are able to pull the other 85s through, through probably just in the nick of time to not wipe out the planet and the race, I hope. Um, have you got anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's obviously the work he's doing. I, I, I'm not um, aware of the book. I'm looking at the hundreds of books over there. I haven't got the book and I don't know. But I think these contemporary writers, some of them, you know, are very, very well tuned in. And it's their sole purpose to bring through important things. Yes, that figure does need to grow. Um, if what one of the great, uh, I, I, I think the second ray, um, this idea of the reappearance of the Christ, uh, mm -hmm. if you listen to or um, read um, um, Benjamin Krem. Um, Gold... Krem. Sorry? Krem. Benjamin Krem. Benjamin Krem, thank you. If you read Benjamin Krem, he talks about the reappearance of the Christ being dependent on exactly this uh, uh, weight of, um, uh, and, and I do wonder, I mean, I have to say something in the talk to give a reference point, eight mm -hmm. to 10%. Mm -hmm. In my heart of hearts, I'm thinking, is it now 12? Is it 13? Yeah, and it's interesting opinion. that, yeah, yeah, they mentioned that 15 yeah. could be the critical. I hope it is 15 because it's I think we're, right. yeah, you know. And, <laughs> and I believe it is. The critical thing is not the intellectual understanding. It's the 15% who are operating from Christ consciousness. Yes. I, truly, I agree yes. with your earlier comments on that because that second ray is the ray of our cosmos. It's like the soup we live in. It's what we breathe. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and it's it's where the people can can breathe it in and give it out, you know, breathe it in this way and give it out that way. Yeah, well, 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 well. I, I thank you for that, and I, I, I will share something very personal now because what I've been told myself is, forget Edward, your journey back to your monad. You are tasked in this life and other lives with lifting other people's consciousness mm -hmm. to that Christ consciousness level. And as yeah. a result, you're going to need to go and study Christian theology yeah. much, much more yeah. closely so that you can be of help to your groups. And to yeah. your... so there we have it. This yeah. central point of this talk could be. Um, with the help of these questions, uh, the the idea that Christ consciousness is what we should be aiming at. And it's mm. almost like the rest will take care of itself, yeah. including the salvation of the planet. And just as one more point from my own personal experience, when I had read a lot of other stuff, it wasn't till I came to actually do the Course in Miracles and I took two years to actually do that it's not just reading, it's something you put into place in your life. It's the most profound thing I've ever done practically. And I would say it blew open my heart and my understanding of the Christ consciousness. And it is supposed to be um, the teachings that the Christ tried to get through to us and, and failed in many ways. And it brings it through in a way that um, our modern minds deal with but it's very practical you put it yeah. into place in your life um yes. like that sort of buddhist idea the buddhists are very practical yes. this course of miracles was i found i think it's one of the keys to opening the christ consciousness within you so for me i found it a very valuable key but you've got you can't just read it you've got to do it would you describe it then as a purification process in practical terms incredibly so but I mean, I some days you read stuff and you put stuff into practice and you're observing, you're spending the day as a silent witness observing. And some days you'll read a paragraph and it's so profound. I You're supposed to do it in a year. There's 365 lessons you do in a year. I Some days, one lesson, one paragraph, I'd need several days to work with it because it was so profound, especially in its application. Um, but I had the book on my shelf for years before I was ready to pick it up and do it. 
Yeah. And I think it's one of those. Yeah. No, um, no, I, I that, that last point in particular, we are pointed towards something when we're ready for it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we don't necessarily know when we're ready for it, but, but they do. And we can pick up something and we're not ready for it. We'll put it back down again. That's a perfectly natural. Yeah. And of course, it happens with those people who aren't spiritually orientated. They'll pick up something and they'll mm -hmm. look at it and they'll think, this is not for me. Mm -hmm. So there, 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 there's a good um, uh, tip um, uh, there to um, have a look at, and mm. you know, the, a course yeah. in miracles, which I know I've heard Teresa talk about before. But it's part of this process of understanding that we like to think we have this individual soul, but it seems to me that what this soul is is this huge strata of energy, which is in essence the Christ consciousness that comes in and touches our consciousness and we have to react to that and we have to have an interplay with that consciousness in order to take us further up and until we get that, that critical mass maybe 15 percent the christ will not return until yeah. there's sufficient numbers yeah. to be able to support yeah. the work that needs to be done yeah. so this is why i'm kind of you know and maybe Teresa will agree pointing towards the way theosophy needs to perhaps be resituated in order to accept um, uh, the responsibility for humanity's further development. But we have it there in the objectives, don't we? We have it in the three objectives. We have the love wisdom already there. OK, thank you. Uh, Janet um, has her hand raised. Um, thank you. Um, so I'm trying to lower my hand. Um, thank you, oh, Ted, that was a really, really interesting talk. And I mean, loads and loads of points that were really, really interesting. But I, I, because I, actually I was thinking it's odd you've come back to this thing about the three objects, um, just as I'm about to ask my question, because I was actually really interested in what you said about that, particularly about the first object. But the reason I put my hand up is not so much a question, but um, I just wanted to point out um, a book I found in the Oxfam bookshop yesterday. Um, the Place of the Heart. I mean, I'm not suggesting you get this book, but um, it's actually about um, uh, orthodox, so Eastern Orthodox spirituality. And the reason it caught my eye was because one of the members of the Guild of Pastoral Psychology is a, is a nun, and she's just trained as a Jungian analyst. And her dissertation was about... Um, if I can pronounce it correctly, mm. uh, hesychasm, hes 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 which is um, an ancient um, Christian doctrine of the heart, and it comes from the Desert Fathers. And she gave a wonderful talk on this. And, and, I, and I immediately thought, you know, we don't talk about this in, in the TS in terms of Christianity so you're yeah. absolutely right mm. um but I but I but I risk I, I commend and I'll, I'll put the, the name in the chat I commend um he, he, if I could pronounce it hesic to you because in in what she was saying there is the Christian doctrine of the heart and it yeah. comes from about um well it comes from the very early centuries of Christianity so I yeah. just point no, no. And, and that's very helpful for all of us, Janet. Do put it in the chat. And what, what I think is that spirits are always looking for individuals and they give them a splinter of the truth to camp it in this way or that way or whatever, so that there can be a number of people who pick up the book and get into it through that channel or get into it through a different channel. And I think Christianity's got a bad name because of what the churches have done with it. And you need something maybe detached from that orthodoxy to be able to see the truth. Otherwise, the truth is being buried. And the truth is to do with the heart doctrine and the fact that this is the center. You know, I was given a picture of a heart in a dream. It was only a dream. It wasn't a vision. But there was in that heart was the center of absolute goodness. And in this center of absolute goodness, nothing, nothing could touch it. It was actually the source of everything that was. And it just came across as good. It was 
it was much deeper than that, but it was good. So I know, we all know that the heart is very, very important. It's ex it's extremely um, important in that it doesn't get mixed up with emotion. And I'm mm. sure that this book that you've got here doesn't mix it up with emotion. It's very much, you know, um, I, I call the solar plexus center of emotion the happy, sad mm. center because it's a duality. And I call the heart center the center of joy because it's a unity. And anything that can help us to realize that unity at the heart center is going an awful long way to imbuing us with the Christ consciousness. Mm. Thank so you. I just wanted to add, actually, um, that because you talked about art, too. And if you look um, here, here is the Christ in, in, the, in the heart of the Virgin, in, in effect. And I just wanted to point out that a lot of Eastern Orthodox paintings have this same image with the, with the Christ actually in the place of the heart, in the place of the spiritual heart, in fact. So, so um, That fits beautifully, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And, and, um, and it's worth looking out for that. Yes, Thank most Thank definitely. You. Thank you for coming through on that, Janet. Yeah. OK, thank you, Janice, and thank you, Ted. Um, Deborah has put um, quite an interesting question uh, in the chat box. Deborah, would you like to um, put your question to Ted? Would you like to unmute yourself? Hi, Ted. Hi, Deborah. In the chat, I put, uh, when you were answering uh, the first question, do you think the majority of the 8% are women? And the reason I say that is everywhere I go, that is about spiritual awareness, yoga, even the church, even this group. It's always a majority of women that are engaging and sort of on the quest. And I wonder where all the men are and whether they're doing something different. If it yeah. isn't, if that if that isn't the case. Well, I, I th thank you for that. If we're talking um, about the idea that um, the second ray, um, as Therese has pointed out, it's, it's the ray of the solar system in particular. Uh, it is the major ray um, functioning in manifestation for uh, the umbrella of humanity. If we take that as being the case, it's a love ray. So we have we have the rays of will, which is one, three, five, and seven, and that is traditionally masculine. Okay, will is when I say masculine, you know, it's to do with in in the Kabbalah, the pillar of severity. But on the other side of it, the pillar of mildness, we have the more feminine um, type of characteristics. And the love rays, rays two, four and six, do have that polarity uh, of receptiveness. So if we if we took away, if we took away the idea of men and women, I would say expressive uh, on the will rays and receptive on the love rays. And it would be my opinion that the temperament of women is more suited to the second ray of love wisdom than men. So on that basis, and I don't know whether it's the case, but on the basis, I would agree with what you're saying. I think it is easier. Uh, the majority of in the church that I'm now going to, the majority of the co pop, um, congregation by two to one are women. Are the ones that lead the Bible study are women. And they're talking about the Christ consciousness, not perhaps in the way we are, but about the heart and about love and about harmlessness in a way that I think that it could mean that if you've got a, fe a female body in this lifetime, you're uh, and and you're you know, you're, you, you've got some input from your soul. You're going to be very much taken up with the work of the second ray. And I, I, I do think that is the case. I think where the males are involved um, and, um, you know, uh, if I say um, the will raise appeal to me, um, which they did when I was younger, but I've had to bring out the feminine side of my own um, uh, consciousness because what is required in the work that I need to do in the future is a more balanced consciousness. So we have to have that balance and the same would be, you know, you, the, a lot of the women who are um, uh, able to express this very loving second ray also need to have the uh, the toughness of the first ray of will, just like I've taken the toughness of the first ray and tried and part of my path in this life to become more passive and receptive 
in the way that I've discussed here. So we've all got to strive for a uh, consciousness which is nicely balanced. But initially, to answer your question, yes, I think um, uh, uh, being a spiritual uh, person who is a woman would definitely give you uh, a head start on understanding the second level of wisdom. But, but again, my uh, secondary question then is how do you, to get the 8% eight to 15, let's say, uh, then the engagement of men would make all the difference. So what can be done to uh, try to enact more male involvement? Can I, can I jump in there and just say, when I go to the Buddhist meditation centers, and I have done for years, there's more men than women. And Buddhism comes more through the mind. Ah, okay. just a just an observation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, if we go back to the the the, the basic teachings of Theosophy, um, and you have these three orders of manifestation that um, Madame Blavatsky talks about in the Secret Doctrine, uh, the first ray to be manifest was the third ray of active intelligence and the buddha comes in on that and then the second is the ray of love wisdom which we're in at the moment and the third will be the first ray so we are actually climbing energies the frequency is getting higher so yes that and that is why the buddha was before the christ historically he was talking about the mind and of course so much of the teachings are to do with the mind and with karma, because karma begins in the mind, you know, it's you, our actions actually cause the karma, but we we think about it before. And that's why such a, a major part of his teaching was karma. It's not in the Christian tradition as we know karma, but that's because uh, and, 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 and Tim will tell me which ecumenical conference it was taken out at or the, you know, but we, 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 we know we know it's there. But it's not it's not a, a tenant that's as important that's as important in Christianity as it is in, in, in Buddhism. So, again, we have to think across eras. We have to go. Yeah. Third ray, second ray, mind, heart. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, Janet points out it was the Council of Nicaea, but it wasn't fully ratified until the Second Council of Constantinople in, uh, I think, 552. Uh, Ted and I, incidentally, will be drinking beer and watching Ecuador versus uh, Qatar in a few minutes' time, no doubt. But uh, there we are. Now, Barbara um, has written something in the chat box as well. Uh, uh, going back to the uh, Bhagavad Gita, Barbara, would you like to elaborate your question? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the Bhagavad Gita pre empts um, the Christian Bible. You know, the quotes in the in the, the Christian Bible are almost directly taken from the Gita. And Krishna says to Arjuna, I'm not, I can't remember the actual quote because I can't even find my own copy. It's been missing for quite a while. Don't know where it went to. But it, he says, nobody gets to the Father but through me, which is what it says in the Bible. So I'm really interested in, in comparing these two because obviously, well, to me anyway, that Krishna is Christ, you know, the, the actual term Krishna. Yes, yes. Christ, you know, so the, the, the parallel is not what came first, but like, what does he mean? How does he mean for you to get through to the father through him? And that, that's a question I can't answer unless it's through mantra or just through... I mean, he talks about devotional aspects, you know, where, where Arjuna has to stay with him, keep him on his mind all the time, this kind of thing, as a, I suppose, as a personality. Yeah. But that's the way to get to the Christ consciousness is through Krishna, through Christ itself, embodied as that person. Or well, well, yeah, I'd like to to, to, to answer that and say I, I thought about this myself and um, thanks to Paul. Paul Barker's help um, and, you know, um, in showing me some of the, the, the Vedas, particularly through the Vedic astrology, mm -hmm. it's become clear uh, that the mind, again, going back to that, and mantra uh, are of central importance here. So mm -hmm. I think in terms of going through Krishna consciousness and also reading, I think, quite illuminating things about the uh, uh, Raja Krishna temple that was set up um, uh, with George Harrison's help in my own lifetime uh, and the importance of uh, the mantric syllables in that Hare Krishna chant. 
uh, is is saying that mantra. I would say that mantra itself, you know, and this is knowledgeable mantra, ma- mantra which has been um, uh, um, uh, formed for the divine purpose of lifting the consciousness, um, is the use of sound in the way that the Christ consciousness, it's another way of getting to it. So I'm thinking mantra is important. I've got a, a book on Buddhism called um uh creative meditation and multidimensionality of consciousness which deals with a lot of mantras and i find them very very powerful but i've been told no for you it's the christian path this was something for the past how much do we go back into the past to find out what we want i don't know it's an open question in other words we've got all these fine tools to work with all these things to how much do we engage with them and i've kind of been told leave the krishna stuff you've done it before what you need to concentrate on is the christian but i totally agree with you about the the quotes and the fact that this shows a middle way to the monad a middle way to the father but it was for a time when we were perhaps being um um, guided by the third ray of active intelligence, whereas now we're in a time being guided by the second ray of love wisdom. But I don't think that means it's not authentic. I mean, it just means that some of us may have done this before. And sometimes if we've done it before in a past life, we get attracted back to it. I like these mantras and they're saying to me, no, 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 you've got to look at the Bible. You've got to look at this now. You've got to look at that. So I do think we are pulled back to where if we've had incarnations in India and we understand Krishna consciousness, then, you know, we're going to be pulled pull back to those things it's knowing where it's going to be progress for us to do that and whether there's something else and for me it's the christ consciousness but that doesn't take away from your point yeah well that to me that is the christ consciousness it doesn't matter what era it is because the ancient yeah. wisdom is is the vedas you know that that's yeah. what the uh, theosophical yeah. society relates to yeah so it, it's still as fresh mm. and i mean chanting a mantra apparently different mantras have different amount of times that you have to chant it before you actually reach the essence of it Mm. um and i I don't know how much it is with the uh, krishna mantra but i mean i've actually done well i say i've done it i was there when it was being done shall i say where you people chant the mantra for 24 hours non-stop and it's really interesting because even when there's small gaps in there's always somebody in the corner that's actually chanting Mm. You know, even when there's a space in there and it's a fascinating thing to be part of, you know, when people gather together and they're chanting this. Man- this is raising the vibration. Mm-hmm. This is taking that yeah. eight to 10 percent to the 15 yeah. percent. You know, it's a vibratory thing. And, and when you've got a group of people doing it and in India and all yeah. over the place, there are, um, studies and people doing things like keeping the sacred fires going. I know it's an old stuff, but it still works. And mm-hmm. once that thread has been broken then all that work is sort of for nothing if you like so it, it, it's just taking it into the modern era in a way that people can understand and moving from the indian way of thinking to the let's say british for want of a better word way of thinking that is more northern than southern or eastern whichever way around it is um can i you know it's not something new it's just an old way of doing things that still works that is modernized if you like to the to the modern way of thinking or teaching or you know climate whatever well george harrison certainly did did his bit in raising it to the consciousness of the the you yeah. know yeah yeah and also yeah. when you chant you open the throat chakra and in many of humanity are opening the heart and starting to open the throat And what I find is many people are blocked in their throat. That's why we've got so many thyroid problems and we've got so many problems in this area of the body. And you can't go from heart, from personality to monad to spirit if the throat is blocked. Mm -hmm. So when you read the Upanishads or you read the Vedas, they speak to your heart. The language is a heart language. The Bhagavad Gita to me, you know, it's song celestial, it sings to your heart. It, the mind doesn't even have to understand the language, it speaks to your heart. 
And when you chant the mantras, you're opening the gateway for these higher centers for this vertical alignment. Mm. So it and all the, works the, the, the throat is a creative center. Exactly. And it's the last thing to open because once yeah. the throat is open clearly, then yeah. you are in that uh, process of becoming that co-creator. You can and create it's the center. It's the center of the truth. truth. That's yes. right. Yeah. 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 That's we, when the speech actually becomes matter. That's right. Whatever you say then is on its Manifest. way to matter. That's yes, right. It manifests. Yeah. We we are in the fifth sub-race of the fifth root race, and that five does correspond to um uh to, to the mind. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's yeah. the fifth tracker if we count upwards uh, as well so it, do, it does fit very well with mentality and it's also moving away from emotional polarization mm -hmm. into mental polarization which brings in the qualities of detachment and discernment which we're all learning are very valuable qualities and many people their throat chakra is blocked do you know or it's it's underactive their energy is blocked in this area mm -hmm. um so even if the heart is open they can't you know do do anything with that heart energy until the throat starts to um the karma unblocks and the throat yeah. starts to operate properly mm. 